Good evening, and welcome to Indiana University Cinema's virtual screening room. This introduction and the following Q&A will all feature live captioning. To turn on captions, move your mouse to the toolbar at the bottom of your screen, click on Live Transcript, then click Show Subtitle. If you have any issues, feel free to ask a question using the Q&A box, which you can reach by clicking on the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. To begin tonight's program, IU Cinema wishes to acknowledge and honor the indigenous communities native to this region and recognize that Indiana University is built upon indigenous homelands and resources. We recognize the Miamiaki, the Lenape, Bodawadmik, and the Salonwa peoples as past, present, and future caretakers of this land. We ask you to reflect on the lives and histories of the indigenous communities from wherever you are watching tonight. My name is Jessica Davis Tagg. I'm the Events and Operations Director at IU Cinema. On behalf of the entire IU Cinema team, we'd like to thank you for being here for tonight's screening of Pur de Mila, which will then be followed by a Q&A with two associates of the Center for Theoretical Inquiry in the Humanities, Joan Hawkins and Feliz Chichek. To introduce the film tonight, we are joined by Joan Hawkins, who curated the screening. Welcome, Joan. Thank you, Jessica. And um, thank you to all of you for coming tonight. I have uh, several thanks to begin with, actually. This film is not in distribution in the United States. And so it really was, I mean, we've been working since August to get the rights for this film. And so I want to give a huge shout out and thanks to Brittany Friesner who put in hours and hours and hours and Carla Crowden who put in hours and hours and hours trying to get the funding and the, the rights uh, fees sorted out. Um, I also would like to thank the Center for Theoretical Inquiry and the Humanities, the this film is being presented in tandem with uh, this semester's reading group, which is convened around the reading of Simone de Beauvoir's, a new translation, a relatively new translation and uh, restored version of Simone de Beauvoir's uh, famous book, The Second Sex. And also a uh, shout out to the Center for the Documentary, for Documentary Theory and Practice, who contributed a uh, uh, sizable chunk of money to help us bring this movie and finally to the media school. So um, this film is about the Algerian war. The Algerian war uh, lasted from 1954 to 1962. And uh, it's important to think about it in relationship to how close it was to World War II, uh, especially when uh, I'll be reading you some segments from pieces that Simone de Beauvoir wrote, and she chose her words very carefully, and she chose them to have resonance with World War II because many people in France turned against the Algerian war, not because they woke up one day and suddenly realized that empire was not such a good thing, but because they were horrified at the practices of the French government and how much it seemed to them to resemble the practices of the Nazis that they had fought so strenuously against. So um, the, this film's called Poor Jamila, Jamila Bupasha was an active member of the FLN, the National Liberation Front that was fighting for independence in Algeria. And um, she was arrested in 1960 and she was accused of planting a bomb in a cafe. She denied the accusation, but she was tortured and she was repeatedly raped and under torture she confessed and she was sentenced to death. Now her case was the last in a long series of really scandalous and shocking revelations that had come out in the French press about the use of torture in the Algerian war. And um, there had been a series of highly publicized cases. And in 1959, the French Red Cross, the Croix Rouge, uh, was issued a report about what they were calling camps, camp de regroupement which literally means regrouping camps, but they would be like resettlement camps. And just that term camp had a horrible, horrible significance for people like de Beauvoir who had fought in the French resistance. So in 1959 already, before Jamila was arrested, Beauvoir responded to those reports with acute anguish. At the beginning of spring 1959, she wrote, a little known fact of this exterminating war was revealed to us, the camps, and she has it in um, italics in her work. So uh, from 57 to 59, there was the, this 
beginning of the um, the revelations of the use of torture, Jamila's case became highly publicized in 1960, and um, she, after she was sentenced, she appealed the case. An attorney, Giselle Halimi, took the case for the appeal. And uh, in 1960, at the same time that Halimi was taking the appeals case, uh, de Beauvoir wrote an incendiary article called Poor Jamila Bupasha, which she published in the French newspaper Le Monde, which is sort of the French equivalent of the New York Times in that it was the, the newspaper of record. Uh, and that issue in which she wrote Poor Jamila was immediately seized by the French police. In, um, in the wake of that seizure, she, Giselle Halimi, and some other French women formed a committee, both uh, around uh, she, around the case of Jamila Bupasha specifically, but also to continue to draw attention to the fact uh, that torture was being used as an instrument of war and that in and that particularly rape was being used as an instrument of war against women. Um, so th they, uh, they went to trial, they were not successful. And uh, and Jamila's sentence was upheld by the French courts. She was finally granted amnesty in 1962 under the Avian Accords, which established Algerian independence. But she, Beauvoir, and Halimi remained lifelong friends. Um, and that's one of the things that's really fascinating to me about this film is the film is not only about the case of Jamila Bupasha and this horrible, um, this, this, this horrible uh, use of torture during the Algerian war, but it's also about uh, on a kind of friendship that's rarely seen depicted in cinema. Three women who come together, not because of mutual love or antipathy towards a man, not because they want to go shopping, but because they're really deeply committed to a political cause. And they're bound by, uh, by ethical, political uh, bonds initially that turn into real uh, real bonds of sentiment and friendship later. They remained lifelong friends and all three women remained committed to the cause of international feminism even after the Avian Accords were signed. Um, Simone de Beauvoir published a book called Jamila Bupasha. So the article that she tried to publish in 1960 was called Poor Jamila. The book was called Jamila Bupasha. It was published in 1962 by Gallimard. And uh, this film is based on that book, but the filmmaker, Caroline Huppert, took the um, title from the original suppressed article. And I find it interesting, I'll be talking a little bit with Felice about that later, about the title of this film. Um, the, I guess the last thing I want to say about all of this is, so the, the, the way in which the French government responded to any attempt to get information out remained a problem throughout the 1960s. So Simone de Beauvoir's article, the, the issue in which it appeared, the issue of Le Monde was seized in 1960. In 1962, uh, Jean-Luc Godard made a film called Le Petit Soldat, which, depe which depicted, um, torture, uh, the use of torture in Algeria. And it was suppressed by the French government. It was banned in France. And in 1966, four years after the Avian Accords were signed, uh, Pontecorvo's fantastic film, Battle of Algiers, Gilo Pontecorvo's film, which is set in 1954 to 1957 in the early days of the war. It too was banned in France. This film came out, it's based on Simone de Beauvoir's 1962 book. It came out in 2012. And the last thing I wanna say is that the director of this film is Caroline Huppert, who is the sister of actress Isabel Huppert. And I think it is a sad commentary. We talk a lot, here at IU Cinema about uh, women directors and how they're still not given their due. Caroline Huppert has made 30 movies and since 1977. And it is interesting to me that we know the name of her sister, Isabel, uh, but we don't know her name, Caroline's. So we will be coming back at the end of the film for a Q&A and I, um, to, it's, it's not appropriate to ask you to enjoy the film, uh, to, but, but I hope you find it interesting. And before I finally kick it back over to Jessica, I just want to read to you a few lines from the preface 
to the book, Jamila Bupaja, that Simone de Beauvoir wrote. Um, and this is it. Okay, a 23 year old Algerian woman and liaison agent for the FLN was imprisoned, tortured, raped with a bottle by French military men, and it's considered ordinary. Since 1954, in the name of suppressing rebellion, then of pacification, we are all accomplices of a genocide that has claimed over a million victims. Men, women, old folks, and children have been slaughtered, gunned down during search raids, burned alive in their villages, throats slit or bellies ripped open, many tortured to death. Entire tribes have been left to starve and freeze at the mercy of beatings and epidemics in the relocation camps, which are in fact extermination camps. She was a philosopher and she was choosing her words, words like genocide and camps, very, very precisely and very carefully. I'll see you again at the end of the film. Um, and Jessica, back to you. Thank you so much, Joan, for that introduction and that context. Uh, please come back if you can for the conversation and Q&A after the film. After this introduction, you will see the link to the film on your screen. Please note that Poor Jamila contains explicit content and sexual violence, and a central theme of this film is the torture and violence done to women. We will see you here after the film, and again, thank you for joining us. Welcome back to IU Cinema's virtual screening room and our Q&A about the movie Poor Jamila. I'd like to remind you that this Q&A will feature live captioning. To turn on captions, move your mouse to the toolbar at the bottom of your screen, click on live transcript, then click show subtitle. We will start the Q&A with a conversation between our guests and about 20 minutes in, we will begin answering audience questions. Please feel free to begin typing questions into the Q&A box at any time, which you can reach by clicking on the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. I would like to start by introducing our moderator, Joan Hawkins. Joan is a professor in cinema and media studies who regularly teaches courses on horror, experimental and independent cinema, and on women directors. She's written extensively on the avant-garde, and her most recent book is a co-edited anthology on the writer William S. Burroughs. This semester, she is convening the Center for Theoretical Inquiry in the Humanities Reading Group, which this term is reading Simone de Beauvoir's The Second Sex. Please welcome Joan Hawkins. Well, thank you, Jessica. And um, thank you to everybody for having watched the film. And I'm very pleased to introduce uh, Felice Cicek, who is my, uh, my kind of uh, interlocutor uh, this evening. Uh, Felice was born on the Turkish-Georgian border and studied medicine, art, language, and social sciences in Istanbul, Turkey, Florence, Italy, and here at IU. She's an artist, scholar, and journalist who served as a Fulbright specialist for the arts. Dr. Cicek received her MFA and PhD from IU Bloomington and has been teaching gender, art, and cinema courses at DePaul University, Ivy Tech Community College, Indiana University, and Wilka Jishi. University? Am I saying it correctly? Bozici. Bozici. University Summer School in Istanbul. As a curator, she organized Bloomington Kathmandu Museum of Broken Relationships and Women Exposed International Art Exhibits. As an artist, she exhibited her work in the museums and galleries in New York, Chicago, California, the Kinsey Institute, IU School of Fine Arts Gallery, and various venues in Bloomington. In 2016, Dr. Cicek took time off from art and academia and served as a peace volunteer in Indonesia. Since 2009, Dr. Cicek has been contributing to the Writer Magazine as a co-editor, writer, artist, graphic designer, and an event coordinator. As such, she traveled to Cannes, Berlinale, and Istanbul International Film Festivals as a film critic. She's been published in local, national, and international journals and newspapers on art, gender, and cinema. Her essay on Orientalism and Cinema titled Engendering Orientalism, Fatih Akin's Head On and the Edge of Heaven in uh, this is the title of a book, Handbook of Research on Contemporary Approaches to Orientalism in Media and Beyond. That essay, Engendering or Orientalism, just got published this month by IGI Global Inc. 
And Dr. Chichek also produces the weekly art program, Artbeat for the WFHB Community Radio. She's currently serving as the regional coordinator for Istanbul, the feminist art project based in Rutgers University, New York. So welcome, Feliz. Thank you, thank you for having me. Yeah, no, I'm very pleased that you could join me. Um, so there were two things I wanted to say. One thing I was going to say before the movie, but I, in a way I'm glad that I forgot so I could say it now is that um, as you can tell probably from the aesthetic and the tone of the film, this was a made for TV movie. And so it was, uh, it was uh, finished in 2012 and it aired on France 3, France 3 on March 20th of 2012. And so it has a little bit of that uh, kind of, you know, manipulation of the audience that, that television movies often have. But given that, I find it really fascinating that there, there are the torture segments and that they are uh, represented as brutally as they are. And, um, and the other thing I wanted to say is I think it's interesting that the film is called Poor Jamila, which was the, the title of the essay that Simone de Beauvoir wrote for Le Monde, which was not allowed to be... Um, was not allowed to be distributed in Algeria. And um, even though it's based on a book called Jamila Bupasha. And the reason I find that interesting is that Simone de Beauvoir wrote that essay at a time when Jamila had no voice. And the project, her project was to give Jamila a voice. So when she wrote Poor Jamila, it wasn't like this is a gift for Jamila. It was really, I'm speaking on her behalf because she cannot speak from where she is. And so I'm interested in the way that the film is positioning itself a little bit in that way too, because the end of the film is very much like Jamila gets her voice and she becomes this you know, figure in Algeria. So Feliz, um, you said you had some things that you were interested in discussing. So I'm wondering what, what you were thinking about with this film. Well, first, since you began with the title, um, it's for Jamila, but we do see three women in yeah. different uh, parts of in their lives. So Jamila is the young one, and then the Giselle um, Halimi is um, a little older, and then we have an older Simone de Beauvoir. So we are actually seeing three different women, their life and what's happening. So parallel to each other, even though it is yeah. for Jamila. Other thing I found that doing research for this uh, movie, there are multiple Jamilas who are prisoned mm -hmm. at that time for the same crime. They were tortured. There is oh. Jamila Buhair, Jamila Azazi, and, um, and even a French national who uh, joins FNL and then chooses uh, the name Jamila for herself. Hmm. And she's also prisoned, but when she becomes free, she lets go of her um, uh, Western name and, and uses the Jamila name. So I, I just wondered if that was um, part of the collective um, oh, yeah. effort. So that's kind of interesting thing to meditate. Um, okay. Other thing for me stood out is this dual struggle that Jamila is going through, right? There is one struggle against colonialism, and then there is another struggle against patriarchy. And yeah. hence, she is preoccupied with her virginity. Yeah. yeah. Like losing a body part yeah. or being damaged or, or even you know, handicapped is. Uh, more acceptable than losing her virginity because she will be damaged, like who will have me? And that was really um, striking uh, for me to see. And I don't know yeah. if how you respond to that, but yeah. like I can, I can talk about it even more, <laughs> you mm. know, coming from Turkey, but I, uh, that had a strong effect on me. Yeah, no, I, 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 and the fact that the film keeps coming back to that again and again, and the idea that this uh, triad of women is, is they're, um, they're at different ages and places in their life. But I also think it's interesting that even though we know that Simone de Beauvoir is traveling with Sartre and that she's with Sartre and that Claude Giselle's intended as Sartre's secretary, we, we never see Sartre. We only see Simone de Beauvoir sort of on her own. And of course, Jamila hasn't found this guy yet who was 
might be turned off by the fact that she was raped. Um, and so the only one who is who is with a man and has a family is sort of Giselle who's in the middle of her life. So I also found that interesting as sort of like that, this is one part of your life, this, uh, this thing that most women think of as the end all be all of your life. This is only one part of your life in the middle. And there are these other bookends that are equally important, or at least that was how I was reading it. But the virginity part is very disturbing, I think, especially since it's not, it, they keep making it so clear in the film that it's not even that she was um, raped with a male body part, but she was raped with a bottle. So that, you know, it becomes sort of doubly intense that way. Well, torture, I think, is feminized through, you know, the rape scene. Yeah. And um, also it is used by the French, not just rape yes. but also the alcohol right they keep spilling yes. beer onto her because those are two taboo things one of the taboo, taboo things that they think will offend and you know will get a reaction out of her um yeah. so they keep using that so i i feel that this patriarchy she is fighting against is also twofold there is the you know patriarchy of the middle east the muslim culture or the Middle Eastern culture enmeshed with Muslim culture. And then there is also the French patriarchy, even though yeah. French uh, fancied themselves as the progressive, modern, you know, the civilized, right. you know, they are not free of misogyny. No. Hence, the, hence the book Second Sex by some of the war. Right, right. So, and they, right. but they are using the tools of sexism against Jamila, who is struggling with it. Yeah. So it is really complex. Yeah. I think these are really good points. And I also think it's it's interesting that here, remember, I can't remember the name of the film now, but I remember that um, I saw a, uh, a really powerful film about the way rape was used in Bosnia. And in those, and, and the rape rooms. And in those scenes, the way alcohol was depicted was that the men were having to like get drunk in order to do this thing that they were being asked to do so that they were being depicted not it wasn't being depicted as like a party scene which is the way it's depicted here is like these guys are drinking beer and they're laughing and they're spitting on her and it's not like they're having to work themselves up to do this at all they really are depicted as kind of as um as well as um they are numb to it. They're conditioned. They're yeah. like normalized. It is normalized. Um, and I think it was also disturbing to hear the human rights commissioner saying that, oh, it is not as bad as Indochina. I, I know. Right. I know. And, we, and to even use that word where he wasn't even saying it's not as bad as it was in Indochina. It's like in Indochina, when women's internal organs were ruptured, that was torture. This is, we don't know what to call this, but this isn't really torture because it wasn't so terrible. Which reminds us that torture has been part of human history for a very, very long time, right? Before yeah. Algeria and after Algeria. Like yeah. we have the Abu Ghraib and uh, other, <laughs> other things that the US yeah. did since 9-11, right? Yeah. I think brilliance of Simon de Beauvoir and Giselle Halimi is, uh, which I think that the movie does a good job of um, giving us insights because it doesn't capture everything, but it, uh, Simon de Beauvoir was able to uh, intervene and create the space, open the space to see, look, we cannot get used to torture. Right. That's the scandal if we are getting us used to it and making it normal and like becoming numb to it. Right. Because, you know, uh, the rape against women didn't become crime against humanity or didn't become war crimes since the Bosnia, as you yeah. mentioned. It was yeah. part of part of all the wars and it was used systematically. But she was able to do that. Uh -huh. No, I think that's true. And I also like the fact that in the film, it shows, I mean, I mean, there are two things that are, that are interesting. Since we've been reading um, The Second Sex and, and reading a little bit about Beauvoir in the, the Center for Theoretical Inquiry in the Humanities Reading Group, I mean, one of the things that's very interesting is that Beauvoir was really um, 
she continually returned to the, the to the theme of ethics. And so, you know, we tend to think of her as being like an existentialist like Sartre, but Sartre wasn't really, I mean, he would talk about ethics periodically, but that wasn't his main thrust. It was almost like he outsourced it to her. Like, you, you go, Simone. And, and she was very concerned about ethics, about what, what kind of um, communal morality can we have? if there's no God and if we're all individual agents choosing for ourselves. And she keeps coming back to this idea that there has to be some bottom line that, you know, where we won't, that we won't cross something where we understand that we're choosing for all humanity and there's certain things we can't choose. And um, in her preface to the book, she talks about that, about how, you know, we all are complicit in this. When we accept that this is being done in our name, we are all complicit in it. And then at the end of the preface, of course, she comes back to World War II and she writes this incredible thing where she says, you know, people like to shed tears over Anne Frank and they talk about the Warsaw Ghetto. This is the same thing. This is as bad. We're doing exactly the same thing that we criticize other people for doing. You know, it's really fascinating to me. I, anyway, in the film, what I really love is the fact that she doesn't hesitate for a, you know, a New York minute. She just, as soon as it's like, you know, will you lend your name to this? It's not like, well, I don't know. I have to check with Jean Paul and I should see what, you know, is this going to get Le Tom Modern into trouble? It's like, no, of course I will. Of course I'll write the preface. Of course I'll sign my name. Yes, I will write this article. Should I write something for Le Monde? Yes. <laughs> it's wonderful. One of the interesting tidbits I, uh, learned that um, uh, Sartre uh, didn't pass his exam for the university, right? right? So he right. became really good at uh, his subject matter after he started studying with Simone de Beauvoir. Yeah. But he, yeah. you know, he, be, he, I am curious as to why they chose to, you know, make her second and him first. Maybe he was really good, but uh, <laughs> who knows? Um, I know. There, there are, um, I mean, some things that are written about them say that this is, it is just so funny because he was in this study group of her and uh, she passed first time. So he didn't pass the first time. After he was in the study group with her, he passed and he got a first and she got a second. And people say, you know, and then that became like their role for the rest of their lives. It's like he was first, she was second, but actually she was the one who helped him pass. She was the one who was so good at the stuff he wasn't good at. Which brings me to another point um, in terms of women in Algerian war. Yeah, yeah. Much like, like women in Iranian revolution, women in early Christianity, you know, from Boudicca to <laughs> uh, Bupasha, women have taken uh, up struggles, taken up arms sometimes, they have led causes, uh, they were really integral part of a lot of movements and revolutions, yet they are not, uh, their stories aren't tell, you know, told as much. No. So um, I think I also see this um, needing to uh, tell the story of Jamila, but it's also telling stories of other women, yeah. not just Jamila, right? Yeah. Um, and after Jamila becomes free, and uh, I don't know how many years later, there was an exhibition and there was the picture of uh, Picasso, you know, Picasso drew her picture. Um, mm -hmm. And someone was saying like, oh, that's the picture Picasso drew of you. She said, no, that's the picture of an Algerian woman. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, she, uh, the, there is this collective and the individual, I think also the tension between the uh, Middle East and West, but also um, the communist or the maybe leftist idea and more bourgeois, you know, yeah. Western ideas. So I find that also interesting. It was not in the movie, but um, I think that, um, they are in a way giving all each other a voice, becoming yeah. collective. Yeah. Um, There's that scene. Um, have you seen the film Battle of Algiers? Yes. Yeah. There's that scene that's really um, quite striking in the middle of, sort of in the middle of Battle of Algiers, where you see um, it's it's where it's clear that they're going to use sort of French patriarchy 
against the French. So these women go into this place that's like a bunker. The women are undercover. And they go into this place that's like a bunker and they take their hajibs off and they cut their hair and they have it styled and they put on Western clothes and they put on makeup. And the men come in afterwards um, and talk to them about how brave they are. And it seems as though part part of their bravery is not just that they're, they are going out to plant bombs, that not only are they brave because they're going out to plant bombs, but they, they're brave because they consented to have so much of their identity stripped away in order to do this and to take on this Western identity. And of course, then you see them going through these, um, you know, these road checks, these passport checks, and the guards just wave them through because they look like Western women, even though they look Algerian, they look like they're Western women. And in that film, of course, they are planting bombs and the bombs do explode. Um, yeah, no, I think the, the role of women and the way that women are treated sort of after they fill these functions is also really interesting. Like she's like Jamila's worried that because she's not a virgin because of this bottle episode, because she's not a virgin, that nobody will want her, even her comrades in arms who would have supported all of her um, political action. It's, um, and, and Giselle Halimi is not able to speak to that. Like you can see she's right. struggling. Yeah. Right? Even though she's uh, functioning as a bridge between the French culture and the Algerian culture, Right, because her family, yeah. Bupasha's family asked for a Parisian um, lawyer and because it is hard to have voice or success or express yourself in the enemy's courts yeah. without knowing their ways, without necessarily, you know, knowing all the legal languages. Uh, and so even though Giselle Halimi has a Tunisian past and she says, I'm Jewish. I know how, what it is to be discriminated against. Um, she still, you know, that's the part that she still struggles with. And I wanna like confess something. The reason I began with the virginity um, part of the movie is because my sister, even though we are not Kurdish, she was part of a folk protest group in Turkey and they were arrested for singing in Kurdish. And at that time in Turkey, you could be in jail for 30 days before seeing a judge. So um, they were tortured. She still cannot speak about it. And, um, and I went to see her. It was one of the most um, interesting part of my life. Uh, one of the things that government tried to do to break my sister and, and other band members down is that they wanted to give them virginity tests. Oh. Apparently there was a law from 1700 from some Ottoman Empire time that, yeah. you know, so they were on the newspaper every day about a month, which like really stressed my mother uh, greatly. And other women in her cell tie themselves to her and to the beds and they will not mm. let her go. And, but these were not political um, prisoners. These were not you know, educated in terms of like the way we see educated mm. people. Uh, so it is a very um, much uh, an issue still. I mean, this was in 1991. I don't know exactly how it is now. Of course, Jim Le Pasha's case was in 1960s, but... Um, you know, it's something that is used against women. And it's, it's kind of like, um, it's your fault if you didn't defend your body. Yeah. It's interesting that now, um, like in Burr films, uh, in, in France, the French Arab films, that's often, that will often be used as a way of critiquing the, the kind of position that women are held in within. So you have the Burr community that is already in a marginalized position in France out in the banlieue. And then there are women within that community who are even more marginalized. And there's, um, there's a really wonderful film called Samia, which the older brother is just obsessed with his keeping his sister sort of locked up. He's very upset at any time they get out of the compound and even just walk in the street. And he continually keeps taking them to the doctor to have these virginity tests because he's so concerned that 
maybe they've gone with a French boy. And there's a point at which um, the sisters in this family, they just rebel. And they say, you know, you're so worried about somebody having access to our bodies. And yet every time we go to the doctor, this is what happens. It's, it, for us, it's like a rape every time we go to the doctor and absolutely we won't. And it's the one time in the movie where the mother stands up to the son and says, you know, no, enough. We're going to Algeria for the summer. When we come back, things are changing because, you know, this is ridiculous. It's a, yeah, it's a really amazing. Um, other part of this, and this is the last point I will make about yeah this topic is then this issue is used uh, by the French or by the West, not just in Algeria, but in the Middle East, right? Against um, the countries to say, look, you're uh, oppressing your woman and therefore yeah. we have a right to come and tell you, you know, how to live your lives. <laughs> so yes, yeah. that exists, that sort of sexism exists, but um, Algeria uh, and all the other countries, those cultures existed, uh, uh, way before you know France uh, set foot there, so it's that's no excuse to you know colonize and and other people. Yeah. Obviously, my yeah. uh, my struggle is to articulate that sexism and racism exist simultaneously, and we need to tackle them simultaneously. We cannot favor one over the other. Yeah. No, I agree. And, and I, I also agree with what you said before, because the only time that we or France ever care about the way women are being treated is when we want to get uh, female, usually it's when we want to get women to support our military intervention someplace. And that's when we will say, oh, you know, these poor women, look, this is, you know, we're going to go and we're going to, you know, bring them freedoms. And it may be that they do give some some help to the women but that's not that's never why we go to war we never go to war to liberate the women well, of it's course it is hard to claim moral high ground for yeah. france while you know armies torturing and raping women yeah yeah exactly exactly was there um what about the way the men are depicted i mean this is really a woman-centric film which is you know as you pointed out when we were first talking about this is kind of interesting is that there are men and they're, they're nice men as well as the kind of awful army guys and the torturers, but um, they really do all play sort of subsidiary roles. They're there to help, they, they listen, they give some advice, they help get papers moving along and they take depositions, but um, we, never, we never really see like one taking over and taking charge and saving the day, the way it often seems to play out in these things, it really is a woman's story. Yes, in that way, I think that the roles are reversed. Uh, men play secondary roles. Yeah. Because yeah. in most movies, if you take a woman out, right, the, it's the hero's journey still goes on. It doesn't uh, sabotage the hero's journey. But here, it's it's they are secondary, and uh, it's about mainly shameless story. Yeah. So yeah, and that's why I think that you know I was excited to watch the movie because these stories aren't often told, and they are not really told from the female gaze. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, and there's that wonderful moment when Simone Beauvoir at the end says, "Oh, don't get sentimental." <laughs> <laughs> when it's like I'll never see Jamila again we'll never see Jamila again no don't get that at all of course they did see her again and they became very good friends um well I can go on about Simone de Beauvoir but I think that uh I don't know maybe is it time to take questions yes uh I don't want to break in we actually okay. our audience is full of some really thoughtful oh, good. questions and I want to uh make sure we can get to as many as we can uh there's still time to submit a question you can do so by clicking on the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and typing your question in the Q&A box. The first question is for both of you. Hannah asks, and kind of in a continuation of what we've been discussing already, Hannah asks, in the film, Giselle never spoke on whether she thought Jamila's rape meant her virginity was taken. So I'm wondering, do the two of you read that as Giselle interpreting virginity as a social construct? That's interesting. Yeah. Belize, what do you think? Um, I I think that Giselle is struggling to comprehend uh, where Jamila is coming from because maybe if you don't have um, um, 
sexual, you know, intimate sex act, um, you don't lose your virginity from Giselle's point of view. I, I'm guesstimating, but uh, for Jamila, it is very physical. Like if your hymen is broken, that's it, right? So um, I think that, I don't know if it's a social construct virginity, but certainly Giselle doesn't think it's that important. Yeah, I think there, there's a bit of a lost in translation, you know, but for me, again, the important thing there was that, you know, Jamila keeps bringing up Giselle is constantly struggling and she doesn't want to say anything. Also, she doesn't know. She says like, uh, did doctor say anything about that? Like the doctor examine you and say you're no longer a virgin. So she's also waiting for that. Yeah, she says at the beginning that Jamila says at the beginning that there were some drops of blood, but there's no way for her to know if that just mean if that means that the hymen was actually broken or if it was just ruptured a little bit or what. And so yeah, it's a it's a really fascinating question because um, I think it can be read both ways. I mean, one on the one hand, Giselle doesn't think virginity should be this end all be all thing, which is why she makes the the statement to her but surely you know your comrades in arms will still want you regardless of what has happened um but there's also this like wanting to be very precise you know she's a lawyer and she's wanting to be very precise like i'm not going to tell you that you're still a virgin and then have it turn out that the hymen was in fact broken i'm not going to tell you that the hymen was broken when perhaps we you know we need a doctor here yeah, yeah. i think maybe it's more uh, hearkening to Simone de Beauvoir who said, you know, I'm not a woman, we're not born woman or man, but yeah. we are conditioned, we become ones, right? Yeah. So being a woman and being a girl or virgin is a different thing for Jamila than and Giselle. And also, I mean, Giselle Halimi has, you know, different background than even Simone de Beauvoir's because she grew up in Tunisia before she moved to France. Yeah, yeah. All right, uh, next question. Olivia asks, Jamila has to describe the torture she endured several times, but it wasn't until the minister asked for the specific details that the flashbacks began. Why do you think the flashbacks were grouped here? I think it's a cinematic uh, device yeah. to um, create certain expectation and climax. Uh, you know, that it builds and builds, we don't see it, it's referenced and uh, there is this tension. And, and sometimes if you don't show such things, it's even more effective to believe, if you give enough breadcrumbs and leave it to people's imagination. But I think in this case, since the uh, French military and then even lawyers, even human rights uh, commissioners are constantly mm -hmm. trying to deflect, constantly trying to downplay it, they're leaving it to the last to kind of like put it in their face. Yeah, that was my take on that. You yeah, know, I think so too. It's like the climax, and and in a way, it's um, it puts us the audience in sort of in the position of all these other people who are asking her. You know, she keeps saying throughout the movie, "Look, the doctor has to examine me pretty soon because the scars are fading, and they won't believe me." If they don't see the marks on my body, they won't believe me. If there's no visible proof, they won't believe me. And so it's sort of like, we keep hearing these stories and we keep hearing these stories and it's almost at the end, we get put in that same tribunal position of like, okay, in case you haven't believed everything we've said, we're gonna show you, we're gonna show you what happened. And it really does become the climax of the film. I agree, I think it's cinematic. I think it's really cinematic. Fascinating. Yeah. Um, so someone has asked, I thought there were some interesting moments in the film where we saw Giselle's life as a working mother affecting her raising her children and often taking her away from them. Do you think this works for the audience to normalize the working woman or do you think the audience may have seen her commitment to her case over her family as a detriment to her character? Hmm. I didn't. I, my own response was not that it was a detriment to her character because she does, it, just, it shows that she does really care about her kids and she has somebody there to help her with her children so the children aren't being neglected. And her partner takes great care with the children. So I, I thought it was there to kind of show, I, sort of, I, I almost took it the other way. I almost thought like the family scenes were there to kind of 
feminize her and humanize her in a way so that you wouldn't have just this driven attorney who cares about nothing but the law, but that you see somebody actually having to make this work-life balance. So for me, it, it worked It worked to keep her sympathetic. But I don't know, Felice, what do you think? I think it did both. I think it played with us as audience members to show, um, like it raised that issue definitely. Uh, and then it relieved us because it says your grandparents will receive you, right? When she has to. Yeah. Send them. So there's yeah. someone, there's always someone caring for them. And I think also in her answer to Jamila about, um, you know, planting a bomb and maybe killing people, she says, uh, when you get older, when you have children, you look at these things differently. So we know that she puts her children or, or her children informs her life and her work and everything that she does. So I, mm -hmm. I think that maybe it harkens to that, the difficulty of being a working woman, but it also shows how she's handling it. Yeah, it's also interesting that we don't see the children um, rebelling against Jamila. You know, like when mm -hmm. Jamila is getting dressed to go to meet the Sikad, that little boy is just obviously infatuated as can be with her. And so there's that, so you, I think you also get that feeling like the children aren't resenting her for taking mom away. They kind of see her as this new member of the family who's just kind of entrancing. So someone has asked back to more of a filmmaking. Uh, do we know how Jamila Bupacha felt about the film? The only response from her I was able to find, which was sourceless on IMDb, is that she disapproved of the film and tried to have production shut down. Oh, I did not know that. I did not know that. Um, so no, I, I don't know how she responded to the film. And that's interesting that she wanted to have the production shut down. I too looked up, but I didn't find um, I didn't find anything. Maybe there is such a thing, but I don't know. I um, I didn't do a, like a really long uh, research, but um, I, because I was curious as to what she might think about it, but I don't know either. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Um. So someone has asked. There's a. Uh, I think we've got time for maybe two more questions. Um, so we'll we'll wrap things up. But this one is, there's a theme of people's willingness to lie for their own sake. The doctors wanted to lie about the evidence of torture for their own safety, and the offices about the possibility of torture. Do you think this is a critique on the French military or human behavior in general? I think it's certainly of anybody in power. I mean, mm -hmm. I, th I think that th that's one of the questions that she keep, that Simone de Beauvoir keeps going back to over and over again. She doesn't believe in a human character. I mean, she didn't as, a, as an existentialist. She thought we made, it, we made it up as we went. But she also certainly believed very much in a notion of situation and that the situation that you find yourself in dictates um, perhaps the possibilities that you see open to yourself. And so one of the things I believe absolutely is that these people who have something to cover up, these people who, um, that there's a way in which you don't necessarily tell the truth. Like there's that moment in the film where the woman is talking to them and saying, well, you know, that you've created this problem among the doctors because the doctors are feeling like if she really did plant the bomb, then they're willing to say she wasn't tortured because they think that she should go to jail for right. what she yeah. did. And, um, and so there is this way in which, just in the same way that there's a, you know, the life work balance, there's this, this thing about, you know, the truth and ethics, truth, ethics, and kind of your own tugging of your heartstrings that don't necessarily go hand in hand. But I think that it's universal. I don't think it's just French. I mean, I certainly think Simone de Beauvoir would say the same thing about the United States military. Please. <laughs> I think it's about, Controlling the narrative. Yeah. And overall, that's in the big picture. And also individuals trying to figure out, trying to negotiate where they are in this narrative. Because you don't know which way the narrative is gonna go. You don't know if you know Bupasha is gonna prevail or French are gonna prevail. And you want it's it's more, you know, self-preserving. And in that sense, I think it is a human condition wanting to watch out for yourself. Even their friend, you know. Uh, Pompey says, oh, you're 
you know, you have a job, you are in a relationship, you have children, you know, what are you doing, right? Yeah. Um, so sometimes we want to also be, we tell our friends and loved ones to like, be safe, don't do this. And so that part is, I think, human nature. But at the end, I think that wars are won by controlling the narrative, not by bombs, not by militaries, not by bullets, mm. per se, but controlling the narrative. And that is why writing the article in Le Monde, writing a book, getting the public opinion, you know, swayed was very important for Giselle Halimi and Simone de Beauvoir. It was yeah. one through the, through the narrative. Yeah, it's also interesting the way the film, and this may go back to that earlier question about what Bupasha felt about the film, because there is this way in which it seems like once the real French wheels of justice are spinning, are turning, then it's going to turn out all right. And she's being held and then the avian accords are signed and it looks like, okay, so now all the political prisoners are released. But what I read was that the French court actually upheld the, um, the, um, the, the uh, finding against her, they actually, they upheld her guilty sentence. And it was after that she was being held to be executed. And that's when the Avian Accords were signed. And she was then um, amnesty along with the rest of the, with the rest of the political prisoners. And so, so never think, acquitted. Yeah, so I think that the, the film kind of made the French legal system look a little bit better than it actually was. Because once we've got, you know, that guy with that, I love that. Talk about narrative. The guy with that long, long thing that he's stretching out. <laughs> and he's, it looks like those games you play with your children, the, the folding card games, you know, stretch it out. And there's this whole. And I think that was hilarious in a way. And in mm. a, I, I'm being a little sarcastic um, out of desperation, but <laughs> it, it's that justice did not prevail. Right. And then it takes us back to Bupasha yeah. uh, and why she joined FLN, right? Yeah, why right. she thinks that sometimes you have to take up arms. And, and Simone de Beauvoir herself says that, you know, sometimes you, you may have to resort to violence having lived under Nazi occupation. So right. uh, right. when is violence um, uh, okay and when it's not, right? It right. brings us back to that. So right. because the court system because Giselle Halimi doesn't agree with that, right? But it just, uh, our system didn't <laughs> prevail. Yeah, but, and there's also that one, that great moment when the women are leaving that horrible minister's office after he said, you know, she, fan Bupasha fancies herself some sort of Joan of Arc. She wants to fight for Algerian independence and, and Beaufort is getting up and she's saying, you know, we were all 20 years old and thought we were Joan of Arc and we joined the resistance and you thought that was fine. You know when we were doing that and he said boy yeah because that was for France but go get it. So our final question is a follow-up to Felice who spoke about women's roles in revolutions and the significance of telling stories like those of Jamila's. Um, could you to address the question thinking about agency and victimhood and the power of telling any stories about women even when those are stories of painful suffering and abuse is there a point where retellings of those stories become unproductive to the cause? Um, I do. I did think about Jamila a lot with a lot of sympathy uh, as uh, she was having to tell her story because um, retelling is reliving and re-traumatizing yourself. If there hasn't enough time passed, if you don't have emotional distance, if there isn't healing, and healing doesn't take place when there is no acknowledgement, you know, uh, as quickly. Mm -hmm. So, and here she is, not only she has to relive and re-traumatize herself, and she has to kind of petition to say, I, I have to tell you my story. So I think it's a delicate balance. It's like, um, if you don't tell the stories, then, um, you are contributing to silencing to a point, to a degree. Uh, if you are telling, and then if you are in a way that it boxes people into victimhood and then strips them from their agency, then you're not, yeah. you know, that's counterproductive. 
So mm -hmm. you, there are ways of uh, telling stories without boxing people and making them like, oh, poor victim. And then like, here we're gonna come tell their story. That doesn't really serve the people who live those uh, lives. Um, if you make them the main, you know, agents, if you tell the stories from their gaze, uh, I think that that helps a lot. And and maybe if if Bupasha was, I mean, we don't know. I'm I'm guessing. I'm trying to make an educated guess that if she wasn't happy, maybe because uh, she might have disagreed with some of the telling of her story. Because to me, again, this was like stories of three women. It wasn't just her story. So there was a lot of layering. So, yeah. Yeah. No, I think I, I agree with everything you said, and I also say think that um, the more the more women's stories get told, the more complex um, the situation the in the situation become presented in a more complex way. And I can I can see that sometimes people worry about things becoming sentimentalized or too individualized. But if we don't tell our stories, if we don't ask other women to tell their stories, and if we don't tell the truth about what's happened to us in our lives, then we just leave it up to the men to tell for us. And you know we know how those stories end. And um, I can't even remember. There's that one wonderful quote, and I can't remember who said it. Like if one woman told the truth about her life it would cause a revolution. And I think that part of, of um, these moments of trying to reclaim these stories is exactly that, like people, the subaltern must speak. When the subaltern speaks, then there's, there's a chink that opens for real change to happen. And we need to be free, or we, we need to claim our freedom to be not perfect. Yes. Right. Yes. We're not, we're not Madonnas or whores. <laughs> we're not. Yeah. Uh, we're not perfect human beings yeah. or villains. You know, uh, there's a big spectrum of women with all kinds of characteristics. So that's one of the mistakes people make. Like when you're making these movies, you idealize them or you other them. But this, we cannot be binary like that. We're not cartoon characters. Yeah. Wow. Thank you, Joan, Felice, you. and again, all of you for being with us um, for this incredibly important conversation. I'd like to thank the entire IU Cinema team, particularly Brittany, Elena, Ava, Max, and Will, who have all worked behind the scenes to make this event possible. We'd like to encourage you to go to IU Cinema's virtual screening room to see our other upcoming films and events. To all of you who tuned in, thank you once again for being with us. Please be kind and be generous to yourselves and to others. And we will hope to see you again soon. Thank you all so much and have a great night.